A young 11-year-old boy named Ryoma Takabayashi wakes up in his room filled with crayon drawings pinned on the walls. You'd think that he has a ma or pa waiting for him in the kitchen, but nope. Ryoma lives alone in the woods. Well, alone to some extent. After all, he's got almost a thousand slimes there as company. Slimes evolve differently depending on what they're fed. Feed them green caterpillars and you get sticky slimes that produce powerful threat good for hunting. Get your mind out of the gutter, folks. There are also acid slimes that can dissolve bones. Next are poison slimes. They're slimes that survived eating poisonous weeds. They split faster than other slimes. He's even got cleaner slimes that thrive off eating dirt and grime. And scavenger slimes, which live off excrements and garbage. They make great fertilizer. Sometimes, when Ryoma's walking through the forest to go about his daily tasks, he'd encounter goblins and thieves, leaving him with no choice but to fight them. After that, life goes on as usual in its nice and peaceful motions. Suddenly, he hears a voice yell, Don't die on us, Hughes! Ryoma peeks around a tree and finds a group of armed men in blue coats surrounding their injured comrade. They don't have enough magic left to heal him, and if things go on like this, they'll most likely lose him. Concerned, Ryoma shows himself, spurring a silver-headed man to draw his sword at him. After all, seeing a child like him in the middle of the forest is an odd sight. Ryoma tries to tell them that he has medicine, but because he hasn't spoken to anyone for years, it comes off as broken speech. He presents the bottle to them, and when they realize realize that it's medicine, they administer it to Hughes. He falls into a peaceful slumber right after. With a heart brimming with kindness, Ryoma even offers the men to rest at his home, which surprises them. A blonde man points out that even though the child is alone, he has a hunter's outfit. Suddenly, a horde of slimes appear, and before they could attack them, Ryoma quickly blocks the men. He assures them that the slimes aren't enemies. They're with him. After recognizing the slimes as his familiars, they pull back their swords. While they're walking home, Blondie shares with Ryoma that he's an ex-tamer. He used to have slimes and his family has been tamers for generations. They even had red horses and blizzard apes as familiars. Ryoma recognizes this man as someone from nobility and wonders if he's important. Upon reaching what the men thought was a dead end, Ryoma unleashes a powerful magic circle, revealing the entrance to his home. The redhead recognizes this as barrier magic. Everything about this place is odd. A man named Zef points out that there's only enough furniture for one person, making them wonder if Ryoma lives alone. The silver-headed man also mentions how suspicious it was that he managed to get close without any of them noticing his magic. Ryoma may not be what he appears to be. The boy eventually comes back with a box full of medicine. When the blonde considers repaying him, Ryoma says that he can easily make them, so he doesn't have to. Unable to contain his curiosity anymore, Blondie asks, What are you? Ryoma quickly changes the topic and offers them some water. The men notice there's ice in them, indicating that Ryoma can use ice magic. The boy quickly diverts their attention by introducing himself, so the men return the courtesy. The blonde is the ruler of the Jamil duchy, Reinhardt Jamil and the redhead is Camille, a mage. Zeph's the scout, and Jill is the swordsman. Hughes was injured because they encountered a black bear after dealing with a bunch of bandits. They managed to beat the creature, but their horses fled and the fastest way was through the forest. As much as Ryoma wants to veer the topic away from him, Reinhardt still asks what he was doing in the middle of the forest. He can use different types of magic and brew potions, so why stay there? Finally, Ryoma answers that his grandparents were both adventurers, and they taught him everything he knew. Sad to say, they passed away three years ago, leaving him all by himself. Before dying, they instructed him to go to another village, but he was turned away. Reinhardt understands, but this doesn't explain how he's able to survive alone in the forest. Ryoma insists that he's okay. He survived for three years on his own after all. Camille suddenly gets an idea and brings out a crystal ball. This ball turns red if the person who touches it is a criminal and turns blue if they're not. It also reveals their name, race, and age alongside four of their high-level skills. If he's really good at fighting, then no one will oppose him living alone. Ryoma touches the crystal ball, and he's proven to be innocent. However, Camille states that he has no combat capability. The moment Ryoma leaves, Camille quickly shares his findings with the rest of his team. He's 11, which means that the poor boy's been living on his own since he was 8. 
His skills include level 10 housekeeping, level 9 mental pain resistance, and level 8 physical pain resistance. The poor thing isn't cut out for this at all, and they can't possibly leave him there in good faith. The next day, Hughes is alive and well. He thanks Ryoma, who's surrounded by his slime familiars. Since he's still a bit unwell, Ryoma offers him a concoction, which Hughes refuses to drink on account of its rancid taste. And so, his team forces him to down it, much to poor Hugh's dismay. Still, he's grateful for what Ryoma had done for him, and assures him that if he ever comes to the town of Gaonago, he can count on him to be there. They were such nice people. That's why Ryoma's heart hurt a little when he had to lie. He made up the story about his grandparents. The truth of the matter is, he was the one who died three years ago. Three years ago, he was a tired salary man who lived in an entirely different world. One day, he found himself in a strange place where he shared a table with three gods. The gods mentioned that people were usually upset when they arrive here. Surprisingly, Ryoma only said that whether it's a dream or reality, everyone passes away one day. He knew that his job was going to kill him eventually. You see, he worked for what people call a black company. He did massive overtime, had terrible bosses, and there were no days off. Ryoma was constantly exhausted. The gods introduced themselves as the creator, Gain, the goddess of love, Lulutia, and the god of life, Kufo. They explained that they came from a world different from Earth. Ryoma asked if it was what they call the other world, and Gain's happy to know that he's an enlightened one. Ryoma, however, just knew that because it was always mentioned in manga and anime. Though he seemed pretty accepting of things, there was still something bothering him. How did he die? Kufo answered that he hit his head, which caused him to get a brain hemorrhage. Lulutia added that while he was asleep, he sneezed four times. To cap it off, Gain said that with each sneeze, the pillow moved until he finally hit his head on the floor. And that's that. But how? How could he die from such a thing? Aghast, Ryoma slammed his hand on the table. As he thought back to the constant abuse he had to endure in his life, his boss hitting him with a beer bottle to his own father's poor treatment of him. He survived all of that, and this is what did him in? Life's unfair. Ryoma asked for forgiveness for losing control. Gain continued on, saying that Ryoma will be having a new life in an 8-year-old body of his creation. But there's no great task assigned to him. By sending him there, they'll just be able to access the magical power Earth contains. A magical power that nobody uses. But hey, at least he can use the magic in his new life. The gods would also let him gain access to all types of magic. The downside of that is he won't be able to completely master any of them. After that, he signed a contract with the gods to start a new life. A life that he can live the way he wanted where the gods can watch over him. They told him that with the new oracle skill, he could go to the church and talk to them. Ryoma broke into tears upon realizing that he's finally having a second chance in life. After thanking the gods, he plunged into his new life. He was reborn into the world of Seifal, and the gods didn't leave him with nothing. They gave him a manual, so he can prepare for this alien chapter. On the last page is his current status, not so different from an online game. However, all his stats seems to be in brute strength, which only meant he kept his skills from his previous life. He tested his abilities by kicking a tree, and he easily split it in half. Ryuma strong, but he still needed to get used to his new body. A slime appeared, and Ryoma found himself fascinated by the creature. He decided to utilize this magical powers by calming his heart and allowing himself to feel the magic within. He then envisioned it flowing out of his body and creating a magical circle circle around the slime. The slime calmly approached him, which proves that his magic is a success. After this, Ryoma ventured forth to his new life and established a home in the forest of Ghana. He didn't really have time to do any of his hobbies in his previous life, so maybe that's why he suddenly dedicated himself to the study and research of slime. He did all of that with the slimes as his only company. All those three years, Reinhardt and his friends were the first friendly humans he interacted with. It has been two weeks since he met them, and all Already the number of slimes has exponentially increased. Ryoma lays down in the grass, satisfied with the life he is having. What he didn't expect was Reinhardt to come back bringing in more people. One in particular caught his eye, a bright and lovely girl. An old man approaches him to bow. He introduces himself as the previous duke and Reinhardt's father, Reinbach Jamil. A woman curtsies and introduces herself as Reinhardt's wife, Elise Jamil. And of course, the beautiful girl with them is Reinhardt's daughter, Eliaria. 
Ryoma thanks them all for coming all the way here, but apologizes that there isn't much he can offer in terms of hospitality. Reinbach says it's nothing, and says that he went here because he heard that he managed to tame so many slimes. But he didn't expect it to be this many. Eliaria is curious if they can fit in his house. Ryoma says that they've learned to, and has them demonstrate how they do it. The slimes start to converge together into a much larger one. The skill is called Minimize. With it, they're able to conserve space and food. The people are mesmerized by this display. Elise approaches Ryoma in disbelief, as it's considered impossible to tame a big slime. Ryoma explains that a big slime may appear to have one core, but it's actually the product of many joined together. So what he did was, he tamed 100 separate slimes, and then put them together. By doing this, Ryoma has solved the problem every tamer has faced. Still, the ability to tame more than 100 slimes is an impressive feat on its own. Reinbach never thought he'd meet someone who would solve this problem. Elise instructs Ryoma to register the tamer's guild, to present to them his findings. But instead of addressing this, the boy just leads them inside. While inside, Reinhardt presents Ryoma with a golden clock as a token of their gratitude. Reinhardt chose this as a gift because he noticed that Ryoma didn't have one. Eliaria speaks up and admits that there is another reason why they went into the forest. It's because she will be continuing the tradition of taming creatures. Eliaria has come to tame her first familiar, and she wants it to be a slime. However, she could not find any on her way there. To help her, Ryoma pulls out a map and tells her that there is an area where slimes gather to get water. She'll have a better chance of getting them there. Eliaria, still eager to learn, asks Ryoma if he could help her in learning more about slimes, especially since she's not sure of what to tame yet. Not only that, but there are kinds in his house that she has never heard of before. During their lessons, the family of tamers are surprised to find out about the scavenger and cleaner slime. He even demonstrates how the cleaner slime only eats dirt by shoving his hand in one. They're harmless to humans and won't eat animal meat unless ordered. With a determined look on her face, Eliaria makes her decision. She wants a cleaner slime as her first familiar. This is where the problem starts. He doesn't know how to properly explain this. The men go into a circle to discuss the matter. But Hughes takes the initiative. He decides a direct approach will be more appropriate to explain it. In short, if you want a cleaner slime, you'll need to bait a slime with your bathwater. That's right folks, bathwater. The ladies' cheeks flush red, and one by one pull their hands back to give Hughes a strong slap to the face for his inappropriateness. Ryuma approaches them and shares his observation on how slimes that evolve into cleaner slimes are just attracted to water that contains sweat. Who would have guessed? In spite of this newfound learning, Eliaria is still determined to get herself that cleaner slime. However, she doesn't want the bath water to come from anyone else. She wants it to come from her. Memories of Ryoma being scolded by his boss for finishing the work on his own flash across his mind. With a heart full of determination, Eliaria dutifully scrubs herself in the tub so she can finally tame her first slime. She leaves for the forest with a bucket full of her bathwater and comes back the next day with her first familiar, the cleaner slime she's always wanted. While the servants are fascinated with the utility provided by the slimes, Ryoma sits there and remembers his first familiar, who he named Tabuchi-kun. Ryoma looks at what's left of his first familiar, the core in his hand. He can only wish that both Tabuchi-kuns are happy wherever they are now. Concerned, Elise asks Ryoma if there's anything he wishes to do in his life, but he hasn't really thought that much about it. So Reinbach gives him a proposal. Ryoma can travel with them to the town of Gimo, and he can head back anytime he wishes. A trip? When was the last time he even took a trip? Eliaria, noticing his hesitation, shares with him that this trip is her first as well. She was nervous, and she still is. However, it was because Eliaria made the decision to go on this adventure that she was able to learn many things and even make a precious friend. She even met Ryoma. There will always be hardships and sadness. Despite that, there's still a lot more fun and joy to see in the outside world. Ryoma is stunned by the girl's fierce determination and positive outlook. Her sincerity on this matter moved him so much that he agreed to join them on their trip. Reinhardt tells Ryoma that he can leave his items in the item box of their butler, Sebas. But the young boy already has one of his own, much to the shock of everyone once again. It's basic magic, Reinhardt says, but it's still a higher tier. 
Elise, seeing such a young and talented boy, is eager to offer her guidance in the ways of magic. Iliaria wants to study with him too. Ryoma knows little of the world, and only of what the gods gave him. But at least these people can teach him common sense. How glad he is that he's met such kind people. That evening, Ryoma starts to pack all the items in his item box. From the fur he gathered in his hunts, to the equipment he's gathered from thieves. He's got quite the inventory after three years. He stands there in his empty house, proud of his hard work. Before leaving, he decides to visit his shrine to the three gods so that he may speak with them. Ryoma tells the statue of the three gods that he'll be leaving to see the world. Because he doesn't know when he'll be back, he decided to take everything with him. If ever he doesn't come back, rest assured he will make a statue of them wherever he goes. With a heart full of hope, he locks up his home with magic and joins the family on their journey. Sebas casually summons a carriage drawn by horses using the spell Dimension Home. While on their journey, the eager Eliaria excitedly asks him if it's true that he has access to both fire and water along with earth and space magic. Ryoma responds that his grandmother told him that he has access to all the elements. In addition to the taming and barrier magic of course, Reinhardt tells him to be careful with this. By being able to access all the types of spells, Ryoma won't be able to master anything. Instead of being discouraged, Ryoma only smiles a little to himself as he remembers what the gods told him. The family finds this odd, but he quickly excuses himself as having only remembered that his grandmother told him this before. Besides, he also can do some healing and alchemy. Rhinebeck, hearing this, mentions that alchemy is actually a rare field for people to be interested in. Alchemists are known to be secretive, and they have a horrid reputation associated with them. Eliaria asks him what kind of alchemy he works on, but Ryoma clarifies that the only alchemy he knows is purifying mineral poison from rock salt to make it edible. Is there anything this boy can't do? Ryoma blushes, not used to all these praises happening at once. Ryoma's slimes are thriving, and he's glad that he actually went on this trip. Over the next few days, they traveled when the sun is up and set up tents at night. Suddenly, rain starts pouring one day. Rhinebeck is surprised that such hard rains are even happening this time of the year. A rough bump on the road throws Eliaria towards Ryoma, embarrassing them both as a result. Camille calls from the outside and says they've encountered a problem, prompting Reinhardt to go out and check. In front of them is the aftermath of a landslide, and the road has been completely blocked. At this rate, they'll have to take another path, and that's going to be another three days on the road. However, the longer they are in this area, the more chances that they'll encounter violent bandits on the way. Reinhardt supposes that they will have to use earth magic to remove this. Ryoma realizes what is happening and decides on volunteering to help. He pulls out the raincoat he invented with the help of his sticky slimes and heads out for the landslide. Reinbach sees the potential of selling such technology that he wants to introduce Ryoma to his friend named Serge of the Morgan Trading Company. Seeing Reinhardt and the rest of his company being wet by the rain as they are discussing, Ryoma uses magic to block the rain from getting them wet. Ryoma then provides input to their plans. Instead of casting break rock and rock separately, they should just combine the two forms of earth magic into one called create block to make it more efficient. It's easier to demonstrate than explain really. Ryoma demonstrates to them by holding his hands out and imagining the magic flowing through him, latching on both the rocks and dirt at the same time to create individual blocks. By principle, any person who can cast both spells can cast the combined one just as well. All of Ryoma's slime start working together to stack the blocks to clear their path. In no time, this small boy is able to clear the path. Elise hugs him close to her bosom and thanks for the effort he's put in to help them. The task is exhausting, but Ryoma feels fulfilled. It took another three days, but eventually, they finally arrive at the mining town of Gimel. Ryoma, still accompanied by his slimes, enters the room where he's staying. He's amazed by its comfy and homely appearance that a smile refuses to leave his face. He's excited by what's next because this will be the first town he'll be visiting ever since his arrival in the world of Sailfall. An interesting tidbit about the mining town of Kimmel, the production of the mines have actually gone down over the years. This is actually why Reinhardt went on a trip here. He has to access which mine to close down and what mine is profitable. Ryoma's first stop is the church, where he'll be getting his status board. 
as the name suggests. It's where a person's stats are displayed. It functions as a form of ID. Once they arrive at the church, a woman leads him to a room with a crystal ball. She explains that the tablet Ryoma has in his hand is what's called a status board. Ryoma must place it on the pedestal and touch the crystal to complete his baptism. Upon touching the crystal ball, light erupts from it and Ryoma finds himself in an empty white space with Gain, Kufo, and Dulutia. Did he die again? The three gods reassure him that he didn't while sharing a snack with Ryoma. What a relief! Gain informs him that they just pulled his mind to them momentarily. Lulutia adds that he'll be going back to Selfall with no problem whatsoever. But Ryoma never trained his oracle, so how could he have been able to access this? The simple explanation that Gain tells him is that he's led a monastic life for three years and prayed to them every day. It is for this reason, Lulutia explains, that he's able to gain access to Oracle so they can meet. Kufu informs him that these meetings will be brief, but they will be able to communicate with him directly from now on. Lulutia and Kufu compliment his work, like his cozy home in the forest and the clean toilet he managed to make. However, Ryoma tells them it's all thanks to the slime that he's able to achieve all of this. Gain interjects at this point to reveal to Ryoma that the scavenger and cleaner slimes never actually existed in the first place. They were inventions created by Ryoma himself. This made Ryoma realize the reason why Reinhardt and everyone else had no idea about them. They never existed prior to him. Gain shares to Ryoma that he created slimes, but all he did was give them the ability to adapt to their environment and reproduce. Their evolutionary possibilities are therefore infinite. The problem is, after some species have settled in certain environments, it became difficult for newer ones to emerge. It was Ryoma who managed to unlock the potentials of these slimes that even he, the creator, forgot about. Lulutia is surprised that Ryoma is able to encounter the Jamil family. It turns out that one of their ancestors was a person who reincarnated just like Ryoma. She was a schoolgirl whose dream was to become an animal trainer. Her wish when she was transferred was to gain the skills to tame animals. In fact, Kufo reveals to Ryoma that it's she who researched and invented the taming school of magic. Given her achievements, she earned the title of a noble. It's because of her marrying into the Jamil family that the gods decided to individually bless them as a family of tamers. Also, Eliaria appears to have inherited much of her ancestor's tamer talents. The thing is, she inherited more from her mother's side, meaning there's another person transferred from Earth to this world. But it seems that Ryoma will never meet others like him. According to Lulutia, they usually have at least 200 years of local time separation between transfers. To have multiple in one era is close to impossible. The transferee on the mother's side turns out to be a stereotypical otaku. He wished for strong magical powers so he would become unstoppable in combat. It was a blessing that he was too timid to do bad deeds. Even if it was the gods who gave him his powers, they were still worried that he might pull something. At least compared to that guy, Ryoma is a bit calmer. Ryoma has a sound mind and follows the rules. He thrives using his creativity within those boundaries. Ryoma thanks Kufo for the praise, but the god says there's no need when he's provided them with much amusement. Sad to say, but their time is coming to a close. But they'll always be there to watch over him. But before he leaves, Gain tells Ryoma that the other gods have actually taken notice of him, specifically the god of war and the god of magic. They usually dislike transferees, so this is quite rare. The gods of crafts and artisans also gave Ryoma their blessings. Ryoma's body starts to glow, signifying that it's time for them to say their goodbyes. It's been long since they last met, but Lulutia reminds him that as long as he visits the church, they'll be able to talk like this. They then say their goodbyes. Ryoma finds himself back in the room with the woman, as if no time passed at all. She reminds him that most of his information will be private except for his name, age, and race. With that, she gives a bow and politely takes her leave. Once alone, Ryoma reads what's on his status board and is struck by the titles given to him. Overcame an unhappy life and beloved child of the gods. It looks so bittersweet seeing that. Ryoma comes out of the room and Eliaria immediately greets him happily with his return. Rhinebeck uses this moment to offer some advice to Ryoma. Given his strong abilities for a child his age, 
it's not unfounded that sketchy individuals might try to take advantage of him. The only way for him to avoid this is for him to hide his strengths. But because of how prominent his abilities are, this will be a difficult feat to pull. For his safety, it's better if he doesn't register early at a guild and raise his rank to increase his standing. Elise says that with such powers, it's obvious that the gods have blessed him. Certain individuals will find out about this and seek him out, so he must be careful. With what he's been told, Ryoma starts to understand that these are the rules that this world abides by. He must be careful in displaying his magic in front of people, lest he put himself in danger. Ryoma promises to be careful with his spells from now on. He eventually notices that Eliaria is staring at him, prompting him to ask if there's anything on her mind. She says that she's wondering about his total magic capacity, to which he answers that it's 198,000. As if it's absolutely nothing. Ryoma, really? Eliaria is amazed that he is able to utilize such a large capacity properly. It's one thing to have it, and it's another to apply it. It's at this point that Sebas interrupts them to explain the side effects of having high capacity. Generally, people who have such a high capacity have an issue with controlling their powers and learning new magic. Most of the time, people need to train to limit or control their magic. Just another thing he has to learn in this world. Ryuma admits to them that he didn't know about this because he had no one to compare his magic to until now. Eliaria admires his ability to control his magic and tells Ryoma that her magic capacity is at 200,000, something our boy believes she inherited from her wild magic ancestor. She asks him how he became so great at magic. He only tells her that it's because he plays around with the magic to see how far he can push it in his free time. Full of excitement, Eliaria grabs Ryoma's hand and thus begins his new life of magic with her learning his ways. Just just when Ryoma thought he's lived a full three years of life, it appears to be that it has just begun. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.